And welcome back. So far we've been dealing with functions, all of which have been void, some of which take nothing, some of which take multiple things to go do their business as implementation requires. So printing things out and changing things around. So let's talk about the next piece of this puzzle. Right now if we wanted to turn these numbers into user-driven numbers, we would have to make a couple changes. and then do our standard this. And that would now allow us to process our program using user input instead of hard-coded values for demonstration purposes. But once again, this kind of stuff gets repeated a lot through code. So rather than have to constantly type in all the stuff that goes here, as well as validating whether you actually got stuff before, we can replace this with a function. And in actuality, I'm going to do it with two functions just to show you how this works. So we can actually have a get a number function. That doesn't take any parameters. It doesn't need anything. I'm not going to give it anything. I want to get something from it. And you'll notice that I left off the return type. Void is a return type says I don't expect anything back. However, just as we see with main, I can actually have a integer return type. So I'm going to change this to get a int number. And I should be grammatically correct and make it am. And then we'll go over here just before the beginning of it and put an int. So now I've got get an integer number as a function. So I can take this, come down here to the bottom of my code, and write this function. Now this function is real simple. It does exactly what I would normally do in code, but once again, I'm isolating things just a wee bit to create for myself this. But I also know that since I didn't pass any parameters in, which I really wouldn't want to anyway, I need to declare the number here. So that way I can fill it. But now comes the next thing. If we've remembered in main, main has this return zero, which it returns to the calling function. And we always see it down here with the process finished with execute zero, saying that, hey, it's ended up at a zero. So what do I do? I need to come down here and put a return keyword which says give back to the calling function the value of whatever we stuffed in the number. And if you think about it, that makes kind of a perfect sense. We've been doing it all along. So this returns an integer number to the calling function. If we had constraints on our number, say for example, we only wanted positive numbers, we could write all of that in here to say, hey, I only want positive numbers or I only want negative numbers, or I only want numbers in a certain range. All of that code would go right here to make sure we're getting something valid. And then up here, instead of saying this, instead of even having this, we'd need to have a call to the function, get integer number. Now, if we wrote it just like this, what's going to happen is this function is going to call that get an integer number, bounce all the way down here to line 40, Create a number, prompt the user. We only want to do one integer though, so we'll fix our prompt. Prompt for the integer, read the integer, and then return it. So when it returns it, it comes all the way back up here and would replace this piece of code with the value that it had inside of it. And if you do it just like this, that means nothing is going to be kept. There's nowhere to store it. So you have to do one of three things with a call. You either have to create it here so that it's used and stored there, so you'd need to give it a place to store it by doing something like this as an assignment. You can put it inside a function and have it actually create the number here and just drop it right in place, but that means you wouldn't keep it anywhere. Or you could directly put it in a C out. So you could actually use it, process with it, or store it. Those are the three things that you can do with any kind of return. So now we've got get an integer number. If I want to do number two, I need to do the same thing. 
And that gives me my two integers. But this thing returns very specifically an integer. So let's add another function. All right, get a double number. So this get a double number returns a double. Same exact code. Notice the, the similarities here. So we can do a little copy pasta going on. Change the integer to double. Return the number. Enter a real number, get the number and return it. So these two functions now will handle all of the getting of things that we need. There we go. So now we got get a double number. Got to fix that down here too. Get a double number. So right now we're using some simple lines of code to go off and handle some very complex stuff, or at least it could be, and making our, our code in main look a lot better and run a lot smoother. So when we run our code, it says enter an integer 400, enter an integer 42. Enter a real number, 12.25. And there's the same exact stuff we've had before. Now, if we wanted to, let's pretend just to show that we've used the two numbers here, but we want to get two different numbers to add them up. So we can, like I said, use this function directly in another function call, just to make things a little more complicated for fun. So that gives us a sum of two different numbers. So if I run this, It runs this part and then asks. So this function right here says, I need to add two numbers. Go get me a number, go get me a number. I'm not saving them anywhere. I'm just gonna get them and pass them on down. So if I enter 25 and 26, the sum of those two numbers is 51, just as expected. So this is the second way of doing it. And you could also just use a C out, which is pretty much the same thing as a function call right here. This shows you now that you can now build programs that are fairly complex and put in all kinds of testing right here. And if you wanted to, just for fun, make sure that the positive, the number was positive and that it was entered correctly. You could use the old while test just as a recap. So if you were looking for a grade, this is one way of doing it. And we'll just wrap some of these in extra parentheses just to make it a little bit cleaner to see. So as long as I haven't failed and the number's less than 100 and the number is greater than 100, less than 100 or less than zero and greater than 100, I know that I need to redo it all. So I'll ask again. So there's the ask. We have to handle the case of fail. Clear the flags. Clear out the pipeline, put it in the standard colons. So now we can say, look at, look at this chunk of code right here that simply does validation of input, validation of range, and reads the correct one. So this way it forces the reading. Look at the code that took just to validate input and make sure that it works, and I've replaced all of that with just a call.
So my integer numbers will only get me valid range numbers between 0 and 100. If you enter some bad stuff, this won't work. But I've replaced all of this that would have chunked up here and been there not once but twice, and probably a third time if I had some sort of range on my big number, I've taken effectively what looks to be uh, almost 20 lines of code, 15 lines of code, out of main where it would have been replicated three times and replaced it with simple little calls to functions. And that's kind of the point of what functions are doing. Extract individual tasks to do one thing well, validate things, and keep on running. Hope you all enjoyed it and have a great day.